All right, thanks a lot for coming back for day two of uh, what's been a very stimulating conference so far. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome Cheng Sheng Lai, who's a student here at the University of Edinburgh, and he's going to be talking to us about curing epistemic vertigo by epistemic gradualism and intellectual humility. Thanks a lot. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for your coming. And today I'm going to talk about curing epistemic vertigo by epistemic gradualism and intellectual humility. It's a quite fresh and primary idea about this topic, and I think this topic currently is still underexplored. And I hope today after my talk, um, you can be more interested in about the discussion around. And today there will be basically four parts in my talk. The first part I will introduce what is epistemic vertical, and I will try to say that epistemic vertical is a kind of byproduct of epistemic angst brought by uh, radical skepticism, and it's a kind of anxious, anxiety is a kind of unsatisfaction about the impact brought by radical skepticism, even though we know that skepticism is false. And then I will try to argue that a complete response to skepticism should include a diagnosis and a cure of the epistemic vertigo, so that the problem of epistemic, uh, the problem of skepticism can be overcome completely, completely. And then in the second part, I will give one of my diagnoses. I mean one of, which means that there can be multiple reasons that causes epistemic vertigo. And I try to give you one of the important ones that I think should be interesting. And I will try to say the epistemic vertigo is rooted in our expectation of a better epistemic status, which means uh, our expectation for a perfect level of knowledge. And this expectation is rooted in our intuition of epistemic absolutism which means that knowledge is absolute rather than gradable. And after that, I will try to argue that to overcome this kind of epistemic vertigo, we should accept epistemic gradualism to remove our intuition about epistemic uh, absolutism. And I will try to defend epistemic gradualism from some objections to it. In the end, I will try to give you a, a roughly picture about how to cure epistemic vertigo by combining epistemic gradualism and the attitude of intellectual humility. So that would be a basic logical chain of my today's talk. So let's move on to the first part, what is epistemic vertigo? Here we can see the the concept of epistemic vertigo is um, raised by Cameron Bauti and Duncan Richard and is discussed in Duncan's recent book. And epistemic vertigo is one problem that I think most of us will meet when we are trying to deal with the problem of radical skepticism. Even though we are 100% sure that I believe that I have both hands. I 100% sure that the conclusion of skepticism is false. And even I'm 100% sure what the problem is those arguments for skepticism are. Even though when we look back to the problem itself, when we look back to the skepticism paradox, there is still something unsecure, unsatisfactory, and something anxious lingering remains unsolved. So this kind of feeling, according to Vought and Pritchard, after all, is a kind of phobia. It's relevant to a feeling of fearness, but one that has as its roots a rational basis, even though the fear itself is not rationally grounded and recognized as such. And there we can see another quotation, another discussion about the epistemic vertical. We can see the epistemic vertical 
In the end, we can characterize it as a kind of epistemic phobia brought by radical skepticism, which remains unsolved and keeps inducing intellectual anxiety, even if one knows how to refute those arguments for skepticism and firmly believes that the skepticism's pro the conclusion is false. So, we can give an analogy between epistemic vertical to a uh, phobia about the height. It's a little bit similar to when we are climbing to the rooftop of a high building and we look down through the rooftop, we will feel the fearness about the height, even though we know our circumstance is safe. So that is a similar feeling of epistemic ascent in this case. So there is a very interesting characteristic about the epistemic vertical, that is it can be believed discorded, which means it can, to some extent, contract your belief, your rational belief. So, this can be like, on one hand, I surely do believe that I do know some quotidian proposition, for example, I have both hands. However, on the other hand, I still feel there seems to be something suspicious and unsatisfactory lingering. So, I will suggest it will be helpful to understand epistemic vertical in terms of epistemic alien. And so, what is alien? I will give you two examples to give you an insight about this concept. The first example is a skywalk example. This is the world's largest uh, glass skywalk in Zhangjiajie, China. And look down through the transparent glass bridge, you can see the Bay Lake needs your feet. And naturally, you will feel a kind of fearness. You will be not willing to cross the, the bridge without hesitation. You may even crumb and even be dropped through the bridge like this. But please notice, those tourists here, those tourists in fear, they should be 100% sure that it is, it is safe to cross the skywalk. Most of them are sure that the skywalk is solid and they will not fall through down the skywalk when they cross the bridge. Otherwise, they will not risk their lives there, right? But on the other hand, even though they believe rationally these things, saying that the skywalk is safe, they seem to be alien, something different, something which contain, whose contents can be described as, oh, too hot, dangerous, get out of it. This can be the contents of their alien. And another case is toilet restaurant. It's a weird restaurant though. However, to be honest, this is delicious curry instead of something else. This is delicious chocolate ice cream instead of something else. But I believe most of us, when you are asked to eat them in such a to in such not a toilet, such a restaurant. <laughs> you still feel hesitate to eat those delicious food. So the similar paradoxical um, mental state occurs here. On one hand, you believe that these are really food instead of something else. But on the other hand, it seems like there is a kind of alien occurs in your mind telling you, oh filthy things. You don't, please don't give it to me. That can be the content of your alien in this case. So, according to Thomas Gendler, alien is uh, belief discordant. The action of these response patterns constitutes the rendering occurrence of what I hereby dub the belief a discordant alien. The alien has res uh, representational, affective, behavioral content that includes, in the case of Skywalk, 
the visual appearance as of a cliff, the feeling of fear, and the motor route of retreat. And I pro and I propose that the similar、um, pattern of mental state can be applied to our feeling of epistemic vertical. It'll be like on one hand, I firmly believe that I know I have both hands, but on the other hand, I think to a leaf something upside, something that I know is irrational and believe discordant. Surely, it will be irrational to believe that I don't have both hands. For most of us, I assume. However, this fearness, this vertical, seems not be so easy to remove when we realize this rational conclusion. So, this epistemic alley, I suggest, will generate the epistemic vertical. So, now the problem is most of responses to radical skepticism nowadays are trying to give you an objection to those arguments of、uh, for skepticism, try to tell you rationally. What is problematic about the argument for those skepticism arguments, and telling you maybe the argument is not valid or not sound. So rationally, you can be、um, you can be convinced that the skepticism is false. But however, the impact brought by skepticism is not overcome completely. So I suggest a complete response to. Skepticism should include at least one diagnosis of the epistemic vertical, and a corresponding cure to this vertical. So now I will give you one of diagnoses that I think is. Of course, there can be other diagnoses, and I will be happy to see other diagnoses. And but this one I think can explain why we will get this kind of. Believe this cotton daily when we are faced with the epistemic vertical. So now, the background, or say the basis of discussing epistemic vertical, is that we firstly agree that I know I have both hands. If you don't accept this conclusion, if you are convinced by skepticism. There is no room for you to discuss epistemic vertical、uh, in the future. The first thing you need to do is to read some philosophical papers, and and after you、uh, agree that the skepticism's conclusion is false, and you know that I have,、uh, you believe that I know I have both hands. We should look back to our epistemic status, what our knowledge of Cartesian propositions are. I believe most、um, most of the epistemologists will agree that our knowledge of everyday knowledge is a kind of fallible knowledge, which means there can be a possible world where we call, where we can call it a skeptical scenario. For example, you are deceived by a deceiving demon, or you are brain of that, and you are convinced by everything that you thought you know, that actually every perception, every justification, every evidence that you get are just illusions. And the skeptical scenario is, by definition, indistinguishable from those real scenario, the real life scenario that you think you are living. So that is what we call fallible knowledge. And on the contrary, there can be another ideal, epistemic status of holding an infallible knowledge of our Cartesian proposition. So what can it be like? Probably it will be like that. There is a Superman who has a very supernatural ability to distinguish the skeptical scenario from our real life scenario.、Uh, or probably she is a super sensitive subject who can have a super sensitive knowledge about、uh, about everyday knowledge. She will stop believing that I have both hands. If she were in a possible world where she is not, but when we look back to our rationality, we'll find this infallible knowledge seems to be 
irrational and unrealistic. There is some limitation about our rationality, which will makes us only be able to be a fallible knower of Cartesian proposition instead of an infallible knower. But still, when we are facing with epistemic vertical, we feel a feeling of unsatisfaction, a feeling of insecurity. We are saying unsatisfaction and insecurity, which means there can be a more satisfactory epistemic status and a more secure state of、um, epistemic status. So, what can it be? Probably, it can be a kind of status holding an infallible knowledge about Cartesian proposition. We are unsatisfactory about our current epistemic status. So. Probably, we will be willing to get a better. We will have this expectation to get a better epistemic status. So, the basic of this expectation will be like we fear that、uh, an infallible knowledge is better than a fallible knowledge. It will be more desirable. It will be more ideal if I can rule out every possibility that I am deceived by a deceiving demon. Right. So, okay. The similar thought can be found in Duncan's book. I think the answer to this question, which means the epistemic radicalizing, the fact that radical skepticism, while being in many ways very unnatural, ah.、Uh, Nonetheless, arises out of very natural intellectual inclination and aspirations. We got the inclinations and aspirations for a better epistemic status. This epistemic status can be, I mean, can be, a infallible knowledge. But why this unsatisfaction and insecurity will result in the belief discordant epistemic alien? That is because when we look back to the infallible knower and the fallible knower, we refer S I here to an infallible knower and refer and S F refers to a fallible knower. We'll have an intuition that a subject S I, like maybe a god, who is able to know Cartesian proposition P infallibly, in a better is in a better epistemic status than a subject S F, like. Common people, you and me, who could at most be a fallible knower of P if she ever knows that P. So there will be two options. There can be two interpretation of this intuition. That is, now that we say as I is in a better epistemic status than as a, there will be two choices. The first interpretation is to conclude that both S I and S F know that P, but S I knows that P better than S F does. So the first interpretation explains the better expe-、uh, the epistemic status in terms of both of them are knower. They both know that P, but one knows that P better than another person. That is why it is a better epistemic status. The second interpretation can be only S I knows that P. S F's fallible true belief, even if it's true belief of P, cannot be counted as knowledge. So why S I is in a better epistemic status? Because she knows, but we don't. Obviously, she's in a better epistemic status than us. And I suggest. To accept the first interpretation, it will means that we should accept a, I think, a controversial view called epistemic gradualism, which means knowledge is gradual, which means that we can say a subject knows that P better than another person. And if we try to accept interpretation two, then. The belief discordant a life occurs here, 
because this interpretation teaches us that you don't know that everyday knowledge, even though when you trying to resort to your rational conclusion, your rational judgment about the conclusion of skepticism, you will say, "I do know that I have both ends." The this interpretation teaches you the different frame. So, if we accept the second interpretation, we will need to bite the bullet of epistemic vertical. Then there can be two ways to、um, avoid this result. The first way is a very undercutting way. Is try to prove that the infallible knower, as I, is not. In a better epistemic status than as a, I know this approach can be very, very controversial and very, very counterintuitive. But similar thoughts can be found in Ferenc's forthcoming paper. In this paper, he tried to argue that he tried to argue a problem that he calls the redundancy problem, which means the. Infallible justification doesn't has doesn't have a stronger justificatory link to the truth than available justification. So, thereby, an infallible knowledge is not in a stronger justificatory link to the truth than available knowledge, because the the um. Possibility, because the probability of an infallible knowledge to be true is totally the same with the probability of a fallible knowledge to be true. Right? Because knowledge itself, no matter fallible or infallible, requires the truth condition. So in that case, Hetherington will say that in the end, both are true and they don't share. They don't have a better justification linked to truth, though. Probably an infallible knower is not in a better epistemic status than a fallible knower. This approach can be controversial and can be problematic, as most of you maybe think of. That is, maybe there is more than a factor about,、uh, rather than truth, there can be other factors that we should take into consideration when we are thinking about the value of knowledge. But I think this approach is interesting and needs to be paid more attention to. And I think this one may get some promising future, probably. But I will not defend this one here. I will try to focus on another approach. That is to accept epistemic gradualism.、Uh, a view try to contend that knowledge can be gradual. So if we accept this approach. Then, firstly, we accept an infallible knower enjoys a better epistemic status than a fallible knower, which is different from the previous approach. And then, we make sure that both infallible and fallible knowers know that p, that is the basic of discussing epistemic vertical. In the end, we try to explain the better epistemic status of S I in terms of that the infallible knower knows that p. Better than the fallible knower do. As I mentioned before, the epistemic gradualism is a controversial view, because traditionally in the history of epistemology, it seems to be a traditional view, and seems to be a kind of consensus that knowledge is not gradable. And this point of view is adopted by Hetherington as epistemic absolutism. Which means knowledge is an absolute affair. It's a yes or no affair. One can only know that p or doesn't know that know that p. There is no possibility that one can know that p better than another person, or one can know that p better than he knows that q. So there will be a dilemma for us when we try to cure our epistemic vertical. On one horn, we got the intuition for epistemic absolutism. We got the intuition, or I will say, it's a kind of prejudice that knowledge 
is not gradable. Knowledge is absolute. So we will be inclined to reject the first interpretation mentioned before. However, if we reject the first interpretation and then accept the second interpretation, then we need to buy the bullet that I don't know that I have both hands, which is believed is cotton. Then the epistemic a leaf occurs. So that will be a dilemma. I think a way to unarm to solve this dilemma is to accept epistemic gradualism. And here I will give you some arguments for it and try to say why we should epistemic we uh, we should endorse epistemic gradualism. Before we answer the question why epistemic gradualism, maybe we should ask ourselves why not epistemic gradualism. Um, as I said before, the epistemic absolutism claims to be a traditional view, and however, there is no systematic argument for this traditional point of view. Maybe it's because people think it's common sense, it's common sense. So there is no need to give you a systematic argument for this tradi traditional view, probably. But if we try to figure out some argument for epistemic absolutism, one important argument can be found in Jason Stanley's 2005 book. Stanley, in his book, gave a linguistic argument for epistemic absolutism. He compares notes in our daily language practice, compared this with other problematic, uh, with other paradigmatic gradable verbs, for example, likes, enjoys, leaves, this classic um, gradable verbs, and he found that there are a lot of differences between our uses of nodes compared with our uses of other gradable verbs. So, linguist, so from an aspect of linguistic argument, he concludes that knowledge is not gradable. There are some evidences here. One is that it will be unnatural to modify nodes with very much. For example, it will be outward to say, I know that it is raining very much. However, in other, when we are using other some um, gradable verb, it will be natural. I can say, I enjoy raining days very much. And <clears throat> second is that it will be outward to modify notes with better than. Stanley say, uh, it will be awkward to say, Jason knows that Obama is the president better than Mary does. But on the other hand, when we are uh, resorting to our daily uses of some other gradable verbs, it will be natural to say, Jason likes Obama more than Mary does. So that is the difference. However, this linguistic, of, this linguistic argument can be really problematic, and here I will give you three ways to uh, reject this argument. The first objection lies in that there are plenty of cases showing that notes can be a gradable verb in our daily language practice. So, in the respect of linguistic evidence, absolutism doesn't take an overwhelming advantage over then the gradualism view. Some evidence are brought by Hetherington in his book. For example, it will be natural to say, I know better now that there is a cruelty in the world than I did when I was a child. So see, better than can be applied to our daily uses of knowledge here. And then I know that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I also know, but not quite so well compared with this knowledge, that there are only two kinds of monotreme in the world. So one subject can know the proposition P better than he does when he tries to claim that he knows that another, another proposition Q. Again, I do know that I locked my coffee door. It's true, though, that if I go back to check on whether I locked it, I will improve the knowledge slightly. Knowledge here, in our daily uses of knowledge, can be improved. So, 
when we check whether I locked the door or not, my knowledge will be better than the previous version of knowledge in that case. So there can be some cases, some evidence in our daily uses of nodes in our ordinary language. That is can be the first objection. The second objection is that I think Stanley's analysis of daily uses of nodes are to some extent English centered. Probably in some other language, people's linguistic intuition and daily uses of nodes can be different. For example, it may be a bad expression in English to say A knows that P better than B. However, in some other language, for example, in Chinese, it will be natural to say 我比你更知道方便. There is nothing awkward to, for me when I try to say this word in Chinese. So maybe people will have some different linguistic intuition when we are using knowledge or knows. And the third objection, I think, will be the most uh, undercutting one, is that the methodology that defines the nature of an epistemological concept, for example, knowledge, by analyzing its linguistic characters, may be problematic. Um, maybe effect, uh, under the influence of language, philosophy of language, analytical, um, Philosopher like to analyze our concepts by analyzing our language uses of those concepts and define those concepts by our <coughs> daily uses of it. But this methodology may be problematic if Alan Hazlett is right. Alan Hazlett um, give us an insight about the factivity of knowledge. He finds that there are some non-factive uses of nodes in our ordinary language. However, for most of epistemologists, it will be it will be taken for granted that knowledge has to be factive. So there is a confliction between our the uses of nodes and our uh, our epistemic logical intuition about the nature of knowledge here. For example, in school I learned that World War I was a war to make the world safe for democracy, when it was really a war to make the world safe for the Western imperial powers, which means the education that you get in school is uh, propaganda, it's not true, it's not factive. And so, Hazlett concludes that epistemologists have very right to insist that knowledge is factive, but the price to pay for this is to give up the linguistic method described above. And he, su and he suggests that, in other words, a diverse for the linguistic theory of knowledge, attribution, and traditional epistemology. So if Hazlett is right, maybe we should cut off the root between analyzing the linguistic evidence of our daily uses of nodes in our ordinary language and our, the nature of knowledge itself. So this can be three objections to the faster reason to reject gradualism. Another reason, maybe an associative one, we, both, we know that the discussion about whether knowledge is gradable always come along with the debate around contextualism. Contextualism try to say that knowledge is a context-sensitive thing. So there will be some linguistic objections to contextualism by saying that, you see, there is some difference in our daily uses of nodes. For example, knowledge is not uh, gradable compared with other uh, context-sensitive verbs. So people may be inclined to discard epistemic gradualism if they are inclined to reject contextualism. But I would say epistemic gradualism doesn't always come along with epistemic 
uh, come along with contextualism. One can insist that knowledge is gradable without thereby being a contextualist. And in fact, Hetherington's original version of gradualism is a gradualism that is not combined with contextualism. Uh, contextualism. One can, on one hand, endorse that there can be an absolute threshold for knowledge, and on the other hand, insist that above this absolute threshold, the knowledge can be gradable. So there will be no necessary confliction between the and conflict. Uh, um, yeah. So yeah, there is no combination between contextualism and the gradualism necessarily. So these two reasons to reject epistemic gradualism are or problematic and. Maybe when we look back to our intuition for epistemic absolutism, our prejudice that knowledge cannot be gradable, we will find maybe those prima facie plausible intuition is not so reasonable as it prima facie is. If that is right, and if we find accepting epistemic gradualism can bring a lot of benefits to our discussion of epistemology. Why shouldn't we accept epistemic gradualism? And I propose that one benefit that epistemic gradualism can bring is that it can be helpful to cure our epistemic vertical. So how can it work? Firstly, after having the diagnosis that our epistemic alive is rooted in our intuition of epistemic absolutism, which means we will be inclined to reject the first interpretation and be forced to accept the second interpretation, thereby the epistemic alive occurs in that case. So if we can remove our intuition of epistemic absolutism, and thereby accept an upside point of view, which means epistemic gradualism, then I believe the epistemic alien can be removed from our intuition. And then we need an intellectual humility attitude, which can tell you that, all right, so now we see there can be different uh, grades, different degrees of knowledge. An infallible knower knows that P in a better level, and available knower knows that P in a worse level. And for us, for our common people, for our moral, we have our intellectual limitations. So we need to be aware of, be alert to, and be willing to own and accept our intellectual limitation. We should accept that, yeah, that is me, that is you. That is an imperfect you, that you can only be a factor, a, a failable knower of particular proposition of particular proposition. But that is not enough. Intellectual humility can teach you that you cannot know everyday knowledge infallibly, and you should accept this one. But you need another, for like encouragement, telling you, but that's okay if you cannot know everyday knowledge infallibly. Because intellectual humility plus epistemic gradualism can teach you that even though you cannot know everyday knowledge infallibly, you do know it fallibly. You still hold the knowledge. So that can be a kind of cure for epistemic, uh, epistemic vertical. And again, I will emphasize that that is not the only cure, likewise the only diagnosis of epistemic vertical, and I will be more than happy to see more diagnoses and more cures for epistemic vertical, because I think this will mean that we are a step closer to a complete response to skepticism. Thank you.